It's just a huge honor to be sitting here in Sydney with a good friend of mine, Paulette Smith. How are you doing? I'm well, Howard. Great Thank you. to be here. Thank, Thank you. you so much for uh, coming upstairs and letting me and Ryan uh, bring you on the show. Paulette graduated as a dental hygienist in 1988. Prior to this, she worked as a dental assistant. Shout out to South Yard Dental Group for the inspiration and guidance given to her at that time that helped develop her passion for dentistry. She completed a graduate diploma in adult education and training in 1990, worked in general and specialist practice and public and private service provision. When Paulette graduated in 1988, hygienists were not legally allowed to practice in Victoria, so she wrote a petition to Victoria Parliament to get legislation in place, was one of the first three to practice as a hygienist in Victoria. Now, is Victoria where Melbourne is? Yes. And, um, which, which basically, um, Australia has... Two major towns, Melbourne and Sydney, Sydney, both four and a half million people. And those two cities is about half the population of the whole country, isn't it? Approximately, yeah. yes. Yeah. Um, Paulette had a great career with many opportunities. A turning point was when she was offered a position at Dent Supply International as a product manager. At the time, she felt she was turning to the dark side, but it was the best decision she ever made. The opportunity to look at the business of dentistry from a manufacturing and industrial perspective was eye-opening and so relevant for the enhancement and development of her clinical skills. After Dent's flight, she was involved in teaching dental assistants, dental prosthetists, and dental hygienists, and oral health therapists. This was challenging and very rewarding. Teaching and mentoring the students was a valuable experience, and she, she discovered her passion for teaching. Paulette was the program coordinator for the inaugural year of the Advanced Diploma of Oral Health initiated at RMIT. Man, you've uh, you've been doing this a long time. A long time. So yes. you graduated in 88, so yes. you're coming up on 30 years of in the dental biz. In Victoria. In fact, you work yes. for Densefly, now it's on Densefly Serona. Yes, it is. Uh, the biggest uh, American manufacturing company, Densefly, Great traded company. as X-Ray, yeah. merged with uh, the biggest one in Serena. Germany. And Serona used to be part of Siemens. Did you know that? No, I didn't know that. Yeah, it was a, um, so that's a huge company. I think Siemens is the largest company in all of Europe. And it was wow. their uh, division of Siemens, and they spun that off because those CEOs are always reallocating their portfolio so much medical, dental, whatever. Um, so what are, you, um, what are you most passionate now? Coming up on your 30th year of doing this, what are you most passionate about now? Well, I'm lucky to have had an opportunity to do lots of different things and in the last few years one of my um, plans was to start my own practice and so in the last few years I've actually opened a teeth whitening and dental hygiene studio which is a bit way out there because hygienists normally practice with a dentist. So to meet the legal requirements around that I've um, created a, a structured professional relationship with some local dentists and it works really well. So I do a couple of days a week in my studio as a hygienist. So that's, you know, keeping up to date with my clinical skills. And I work a couple of days a week with um, Dr. Jeff Knight at Professional Dentist Supplies in Melbourne as their business development manager. So I love the industry side of it and learning about, you know, the materials and the industry and the business side of dentistry has made a really big difference to the way I've been able to conduct my clinical side of dentistry. So lots of, you know, great opportunities have got me to where I am now. Yes, uh, you remember she uh, was at the very beginning of Jeff Knight's podcast. Yes. You just gave us a cameo for like 30 seconds. <laughs> um, yeah. So now, now what is pearlywhiteprofessional.com.au? Pearlywhitesprofessional.com.au. Well, that was my website. When I first started, I kind of went, well, you know, people need to find out who I am and what I'm doing. So I put together my own website and looking at it now, I think, you know, it's time that I modernized it and made it a bit more user friendly. Um, but it just represented what I was, you know, the new model of dentistry that I was um, setting up. And interestingly enough, recently on one of the Facebook posts, there's a dentist in the US that's just started a chain of businesses called Floss Bars, which... Floss what? Floss, floss Bar. 
Send me that link, so Ryan. Floss bar. You can go to it, the floss it, bar at lunchtime and have your teeth flossed and polished, <coughs> or get a scan and clean, or have your teeth whitened before work, after work, during your lunch. Was it started by a dentist or a dentist, hygienist? A dentist. In what city? Oh, God, now you're testing me. Don't know. Don't know. Floss, but th there was a huge, on the, um, one of the face American Facebook pages that I'm on, that was a huge outcry. Oh, what's this Dennis thing she's doing, starting this floss bar thing? It's crazy and, you know, it's, um, but really successful. People are actually happy to go and get their teeth flossed and polished. You know, they've got a night out or they might want a little bit of cosmetic whitening to freshen up before they're out on a date. It's been super fantastic. So it reminds me of the model that I started with my studio in that I just wanted to do teeth whitening and dental hygiene and anything else I'm referring back to um, the dental practice. And, uh, you know, I think it's a great model. You know, it gives people an opportunity to get stuff done without the, um, you know, people are still scared to go to the dentist and have... It's in New York City. Is it? I should have known. New York City. Yeah. Amazing. So good. I had to come all the way to Sydney to find, to find out what's out. going on in New York City. <laughs> that is, that is, well, you know, um, if you ask any dentist or hygienist, is it about you or the patient? They always say, oh, yeah. it's about the patient. I'm like, really? So your hours are Monday through Friday, 8 to 5, and the Federal Reserve says a third of Americans cannot leave work Monday through Three Thursday, 8 to 5, hours. Monday through Friday, 8 to 5. The patient uh, goes to lunch at 12 to 1. That's when they all turn their phones over to an answer machine. Yeah. Um, and I always thought it was insulting that, you know, when I go on a cruise or you go into a resort and um, you're, the women can get um, their hair done, their nails, their this or that. And I'd be on a cruise ship and I'd think, well, I, I don't want a facial. I don't want to uh, get a, my hair done. I, I'd like to get it, my teeth clean. Yes. But it's the dentist going to the state boards with their Bible in their hand and it's all about the patient and yeah. it's all about them. They say, well, can the hygienist have access to care and go sit up in malls and resorts and clean teeth? No. No, because I believe that no care is better than sub-doctor care. Absolutely. And and it's like, it's like it's really? Totally ridiculous. So nothing, nothing is better than something. And so they always, uh, humans can justify anything. And they always go in there, uh, and dentists, uh, I mean, dentists are crazy. I mean, what was that joke, Ryan, where if you gave a dentist uh, 100 guns, they'd form a, a circle? Yeah, if you, went, if you went into a dental convention and gave 100 dentists a gun, they'd form a circle and start shooting each other. Like, like, um, <laughs> like, 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 too much competition. When, when the yeah. uh, boards, um, when, when people say, well, can dentists give a flu shot? It's actually the dental board just say no. no. And you're like, are you out of your mind? And then when you say, well, can the hygienist, and a lot of these don't, so, so when they give them independent licensure, I've only seen with my own eyes um, about seven of them. They were all in Colorado. They were all in a town of less than a thousand. They couldn't afford to have their own office and building. Yeah. So they had their house and they got rid of their dining room table yes. and their china closet um, and put in an operatory. And the local people would come in for cleaning. And then if she saw something wrong, she'd write a referral to the dentist up the street. And I'd go talk to that dentist up the street, and he's like, she's the greatest thing in the world. She yes. refers to me to people with broken That's teeth and fantastic. cavities. And all the dentists don't see that. They only see what's in it for them. Well, funny you should say that, because I've actually set up a complete dental surgery in the front room of my house. That's what you, how and you're doing it. Yeah. So, so I you don't didn't have go rent shop space. Front. No, I didn't go and rent a space. I don't have a shop front. I actually live in a village on the Mornington Peninsula, and our population is less than a thousand people, unless it's summertime and we get an influx of holiday makers. But I have a pool of clients that come in from about a 50 kilometer radius. I'm an American. I, I don't know what a kilometer is. Oh, I don't to, even know how many miles you have that to convert is. Maybe 30 mi 30 we still measure, miles. We still measure horses by hands. <laughs> Can you yeah, we do too. Do you? Our really? horses are both 14 <laughs> hands. Yeah. Oh my God. So we still do yeah. use that. So that model is great. But the, where the dentist, I'm the only hygienist that I know of that's currently practicing. And I'm not practicing independently because we're not allowed to. So um, we can't have 
a provider number which means that people can claim their treatment with their health insurance. So our Hygiene Association is looking at um, their petitioning and you know writing things so that the government can look at that as a potential um, future opportunity where a hygienist can have a provider number, provide a service and the customer can claim it on their health benefits. Whereas currently now, people who come to me can't claim, but because I don't have significant overheads, I can keep my pricing reasonable, which is so what they So you're using all cash? No, they no, they can do card payment, or but, but, but they but, don't but, get a rebate from their health. There's non insurance, so it's no, it's, yeah. it's credit cards or cash. Yes, yeah. yeah, and that's where the dentist still has the the. It's, I suppose it's not really control, but it's no, it's control. The, Adam Smith was a Scot, and when he was 32 in 1776, he wrote the Wealth of Nation, which is very bizarre, because another 30 year two year old Scot wrote the Declaration of Independence. Yeah. Thomas Jefferson, so two 32-year-old Scots published in the same year, and it was the first time, one was about free markets, Adam Smith, one was about free people, and America was real, basically the first time free markets collided with free people, and that was the American explosion experiment. But Adam Smith said in his book in 1776 that whenever you see two or men meeting, they're colluding against the masses. <laughs> They're restricting trade. Yeah. They're trying to make it. Um, when, when you ask, like, why is why are poor countries poor? It's always corruption. Yes. And so it's not that America and Sydney aren't corrupt. They're just le less corrupt than you know other areas. Uh, other countries, areas, but yeah. they're incredibly corrupt. And the dentists are, um, and the American Dental Association, they they don't represent the patient. They represent the dentist. Yes. But you were a pioneer. You were the first one that got legislation to be a hygienist yes. in Victoria. And, and that Melbourne. was at the beginning Congratulations. Of, hey. That's and that was at pretty the impressive. of my career. So I and figured so now you're ready for at the one. end of my career, the they want to bring it, you know, oh bring it on. Because, you're a woman. Um, you'll live to be 103. Oh, well, my, my, gra my grandmother did, so got yeah. good genes. Yeah. yeah, women live, uh, in the United States, women live five years longer than men. Yeah. If you go into a nursing home, it's a hundred women and one man named Lucky. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, that's why men should try to be healthy, because so, yeah, if you make it to so the nursing home, how lucky they'd they're be. all yours. Yes. You know? Yeah. Um, so, um, but right now in um, Australia, how many dentists do you think are in Australia? Uh, I think there's about 14,000 registered. Yeah, I, I hear everything from 12 to 20. But what okay. percent of the dentists have a hygienist? Um, it's getting more now, um, but probably one in five, maybe one in seven practices would have a hygienist. Yeah, so... And so it's not significant. So why, because in the United States, it'd be 80% would have a hygienist. Yeah. And at least more hygienists in the United States would have two or three as opposed to how many in Australia. Why, why is that? Uh, I mean, you know, I hate to say it, but I think often dentists feel threatened by having a hygienist in their practice. You're taking a workload away from them. Um, there's a glut in Australia of new graduate dentists because we've opened quite a significant number of dental schools. And for a period of time, um, new graduate dentists have been paid less than a new graduate hygienist. So they see that putting on a new graduate dentist can provide more services than a hygienist and it's costing them less money. They're generating more income. So, you know, they're often choosing a new grad and the new grad often just ends up doing hygiene work until they can kind of build their own portfolio of clients. Um, so, yeah, there's a bit of an imbalance at the moment as far as... Yeah, every dentist I talk to here says if I run an ad for a hygienist, I'll get four dentists applying for yes, every one hygienist. absolutely. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So who gives a better cleaning? A, a hygienist, of course. They, I mean, you know, it's that goes... But, but explain why, because a lot of dentists might be thinking, oh, you're just saying that because you're a hygienist. Well... That's a tribal answer. But what, what, this, why, what do you okay, think the real so, answer is? When I graduated, it's a long story, but I'll keep it short. <laughs> when I graduated as a hygienist, we had like a little box at the end of the row of um, our dental bays. And they said, that, that, that thing there, that's a Cavitron. And, you know, brand name ultrasonic unit. And you only use that for people who have got significant amounts of super gingival um, deposits on their teeth. 
that's like the jackhammer for cleaning patients' teeth. Where what where we focused was using hand instruments, so we were using them to you know quite refined, and we were very delicate. And our application approach of instrumentation was um, that was the thing that we've practiced consistently. So when I went out into private practice, I didn't pick up an ultrasonic because it was a bit scary. And then actually, a guy from the US called Tony Adams came to Australia. And he developed a really nice, long, slim ultrasonic insert. And all the Australian dentists went, whoa, he's a crazy man. You know, what planet is he from? You can't instrument subgingivally with an ultrasonic. And so I went and did his course and thought he was amazing and used ultrasonics ever since. Then when I started with Densply, I went to the US to their manufacturing plant where they make the ultrasonic inserts. And was that in New York, Pennsylvania? In Pennsylvania. Yeah. Fantastic. That was just the best trip I had. Um, and they showed us how to refine our techniques with the ultrasonic. So we really learnt to use the instrument appropriately. So prior to that, it was turn it on full blast and bang it against the teeth and, you know, shatter the calculus off and the patient goes through the roof and it's extremely painful and this, the screech of the ultrasonic on the teeth was, you know, people just w didn't like it at all. So um, since then, I think, you know, with the training in the schools and the hygienists have used the instruments, we're more refined with our skills we're using the instrumentation appropriately and patients it's more gentle we take our time we've got more time to do a clean you know my average I mean I'm lucky because I work for myself but you know I wouldn't see a patient under an hour it would take me an hour to do an ultrasonic a little bit of hand scaling and a profi or oral hygiene instruction or you know whatever I needed to tailor for that particular person and the feedback I get constantly is wow, I've never had my teeth cleaned like that before. You still hear that now, 30 years uh, later? Yes, yesterday. Patient yesterday, I'm really, I'm, I don't want to get my teeth cleaned. I'm freaking out. I haven't been to the dentist for three years just because I'm terrified of getting my teeth cleaned. So she came in, she had earplugs, music. You know, she'd taken a, a couple of tablets before she came in so she could really relax. And she just went, that was unbelievable. I'm booking, where's your book? Book me in for six months, I'm back here. Not even, didn't blink an eyelid the whole way through the procedure. So I think that's, you know, that's the thing is we just take our time, we're using our instrumentation effectively and appropriately. And, um, you know, there's always going to be the, the hygienist who probably might be a little bit rough and heavy handed. But generally, I think that, you know, that's our skill, that's what we're good at, and that's what. Um, the patients come to us for. So how many dentists do you think you've worked for in 30 years? Maybe 10. 10? And what? And, uh, but that includes working at the dental hospital in the periodontics department where there is a couple of specialists that I was working with. So You know, the one thing dentists have to, they always do is they, they always have to reinvent the wheel, you know, because they don't work, they don't, you know, some lessons, it's so easy to learn a lesson in a book as opposed to sticking your tongue in a light socket and have to learn the hard way. And um, so many hygienists and dental assistants, you know, they've worked in so many offices. What would you say was um, things that dentists did in the more successful offices that they didn't do in the least successful offices? Since you've seen 10, I mean, obviously, some were better than others. What, what, what have you, working in 10 different dental offices, what do you think um, the smarter dentist did? I think their staff communication and appreciation was... In, uh, you know that was significant so where you worked in a practice and they were kind of pushing the patients through and you didn't see enough patients and you didn't charge that one for the toothbrush and you know you you had a break at, for 15 minutes when you could have been doing something you know the attitude of not trusting you're giving someone a job so let them do their job and let them do it well um, mentor them if you're not happy with what they're doing and give them some positive feedback you know so those practices where the communication was really good and the dentists were really supportive and they work well as a team fantastic it's always the leave. soft stuff yeah it's never the equipment it's never the diplomas no. it's never the degrees no. 
It's never, well, did you go to <laughs> yeah. the best dental school and graduate in the top of your class or the worst dental school in the bottom yeah. of your class? It's never any of that, is it? No. It's always the people skills. Yes, absolutely. And in people skills, so a couple of people have called me this week wanting to come to your presentation in Australia. And they've said, Paulette, you know, um, we've, we've heard you speak at whatever and we, we really, our, our staff, I want you to speak to my staff and tell them about this presentation on Sunday because I really want to get them pumped and excited. So, you know, um, so just empowering his staff to be, he's not just saying to them, you need to go on Sunday, take, you know, in your own time on a Sunday, go to this course. He was really, I want them to be pumped and enthusiastic and excited and, you know, I'm flying them up there and I want them to be part of the program and, you know, will you, you know, put take them under your wing when you get there and look after them. Like, I want to work for that dentist. He loves his staff, you know, and he's showing them that he loves them and really kind of empowering them to be confident and, and you know, work effectively and help build his business for him. And, of course, they're going to if he treats and them every, like that. And every consultant will tell you that. When you go to any course, it could be at root canals, crowns, ortho, price yeah. money. The dentists that bring their whole team, those guys take home twice as much money Absolutely. as a guy who comes by himself to save the money. Yeah. Because they, they just don't get that. No. I mean, when, when someone calls the office, the dentist isn't answering the phone. It's the, the front desk is answering all the questions on orthodontics, implants, you know, everything. Yeah. So, um... This was unique for me because you um, had me lecture on a Sunday. Um, yes. I, I hardly ever do that because um, the Christians, uh, the Sabbath is Sunday, the Jewish people, Sabbath is a Saturday, yeah. and the Muslims, Sabbath is on a Friday. Okay. So what, what, what was the, the thinking on a Sunday? Well, the feedback, I've run a couple of short courses previously, and it's been of an evening or, you know, trying not to encroach too much on people's Clinical time. Fam and family time. So the feedback's always been Sundays would be good. There's no kids sport. We don't have Saturday morning practice. You know, if I know about it well enough in advance, I can plan for it. And people like the idea of a Sunday. So, you know, okay, let's do Sunday. Well, you, uh, you're different. an original. Yeah. That's I, I think in 30 years, I think this is the only time I've ever lectured on a Sunday. Really? It was for you. Yeah. Wow. Well, and, uh, but, um... Yeah, and it, it's funny how um, those religious days of the Sabbath, because way back 30 years ago, um, you know, Manhattan is predominantly Jewish okay. in New York City. And uh, one of my friends, um, Barry Musicant, oh, yes. Barry Musicant um, said, we're open up seven days a week. And everybody said, well, you can't do that. I mean, this is Manhattan. It's all Jewish. No, no one will come on Saturday. And no one will work for you on Saturday. He said, no, we're seven to seven, seven days a week. This is Manhattan. Incredible. There's people that need a root canal seven days a week. Yes. Guess who has the largest endodontic practice? He does. In all of Manhattan. Yeah. The only guy who said, no, you can open on the Sabbath in Manhattan because people have two things yes, on the Sabbath. They come. Well, there's an endodontist near us on the peninsula. She's the only endodontist for miles. She books you at 11 o'clock at night if that's when you need to come. Because she's got a family, so she does family stuff during the day, and she runs her clinic whatever hours are necessary to fit the people in. So, and I must admit, I do that too. If someone wants what to come I did on a when Sunday. I opened up my practice, um, I put up all my kids for adoption <laughs> and gave them all away, and yeah. then uh, they came back after college. Okay. So I didn't have to raise Worry them. About, yeah. Didn't have to pay for college. You could just go and work hard. Yeah. So I've only known Ryan for just a couple of years Five now. Five minutes. And. Uh, but um, so uh, so um, if you um, ask every consultant in America who's been doing dental office consulting for 10, 20, 30 years, say, what is the number one problem in every office? When you go to office, what is the biggest problem? They always say it's staff, and they always say that um, there's at least one, possibly two, sometimes three completely toxic cancerous employees mm. that have to go. I mean, everybody says that. Then I ask you. You've worked in 10 offices. What was the most important thing? You said how they deal with staff. Mm. What, why, do you think, um, why do you think a consultant can go into a dental office and find out that Mary Lou is completely toxic cancer and the dentist doesn't know and he's been working with her for five years and, and why, why do you think that is such a, um, why, why is that such a problem with dentists? I just don't think they, they like confronting situations. 
you know, I know I've been in a, in a situation where we all know there's an issue. How, how do you deal with it? And perhaps now I deal with it better than I would have previously. And I can see dentists might say, well, she works with me and I'm fine and I'm happy with that. I'm not really fussed about what happens in the rest of the, you know, if she doesn't want to scrub her instruments and someone else has to do them and everyone else is upset about that, I'm okay. We have an expression in Australia called pull the ladder up, Jack, I'm up. So it's kind of... Pull the ladder up, Jack. Pull the ladder up, Jack, I'm up. What does that mean? Well, it kind of means, um, you know, if, for example, if you climbed up onto a roof and three more people needed to climb up onto the roof... Well, I'm already up there, so I'm going to pull the ladder up and you find your own way up onto the roof. So pull the ladder up, Jack. I'm through. Yeah. I'm good. I'm, I'm good. all good. I don't care what happens to so the rest of you. So pull the ladder up. I'm good. Yes. The hell with the rest of it, you. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's kind of... And, and what percent of the time is the toxic person doctor's favorite? How many times have you seen that? Or you'll well, see this. You'll see this. A massive turnover. Yes. Ma nobody stays more than two years. Except doctor and the toxic lady who's been there 20 years. Well, you and It's do like wonder. the only person who's been here during all that turnover yeah. is the one that everyone knows is toxic one minute into the office. Well, I'll tell you a story. Working in the um, teaching environment, there were some people that had been there for 20 years and staff had come and gone around them because they couldn't work with that particular person and the university just went we can't even deal with that we don't even know where to start dealing with that we don't know how to deal with it we can only kind of suggest that they might do this or that or the other but all the really great staff and team members and even the students students were leaving in droves because we well, we don't want to have that teacher and staff we're leaving because we can't work with that person. And that person still stayed. And it's so sad because yeah. Americans, um, they talk out both sides. They, they demand customer service. Yes. But then they always vote in these government unions for teachers and government workers. And in American schools, they get tenured, so they can't even be fired after a certain time. No. And the government employees are formed labor unions. It's like, okay, so you want customer service... But then everybody bitches about the horrible customer service yes. at the government, at the Department of Motor Vehicles. But then you always vote for people who are pro-unions. And it's like... You wonder why things don't yeah, change. Yeah, you can't have your cake and eat it too. No. The, um, so yeah, so, so dentists just, uh, they don't want to confront. I just think, or they don't know how to. I'm, you know, we joke about how dentists learn how to not be very nice people at university. It's like, be a... Bad Dentist 101, that's the, you know, DAs in Australia, that's what they do. You know, my dentist learnt how to be, and, you know, I probably can't say the word, but... You can say the word. Well, they go, my it's boss is Dennis, a prick. He's just a prick. He's a prick. Yeah, and he learnt to be a prick at uni, that's what they say. You know, he went to that class 101 because they just don't have good people skills. They're not good at talking to people. They're not good. Sometimes, you know, you find even in their communication with their clients, and I've seen it because when I'm out assessing students in the workplace, I observe what, how the dentist communicates with the client. And they'll say, well, you know, I've just examined your mouth. You need four fillings, a root canal and three crowns. Um, so just go out the front and make an appointment with the girl at the desk. And uh, I'll see you then when you're booked in to do that. So there's no communication. How do you feel about that? Were you aware you had a problem? You know, financially, these are some options we could look at. This is urgent. This can wait. How does that fit in with you? You know, there's no communication. It's just like, yep, you need to have stuff done. So go out there and make the appointment. And they wonder why the patient just pays the account, walks away and doesn't come back. Yeah, and the dentist, and the, the dentist the, don't even want to accept that. Where you have data for every, we're just on cavities, not yeah. not veneers so, and implants. Yeah. They only drill, fill, and bill 38% of the diagnosed cavities. So they can't even get, they can only get one out of three people with a cavity yeah. to get a filling. Because, you know, and the ones that do well have got the, 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 um, 
lovely dental assistant sitting with them and saying, oh, Mrs. Jones, you know, it's she, they're giving her the love and the warmth and we really care about you and I'm going to nurture this relationship. And the patient, if they do come back, is coming back because the dental assistant is the one who's showing them the love and they're trusting that person. They don't feel threatened by a dental assistant, you know, where the dentist is on a pedestal up here. They won't ask questions, they don't question the treatment plan, they just go, okay, that's what the dentist said. But they'll, the dentist will leave the room and they'll say, so, you know, really, what, what's the story with that? Can you tell me more about that? And, you know, the dentist walks back in the room and everyone's like this again, like, oh, the dentist is back, we can't talk. And it's, it's a shame because if the dentist could establish that rapport and build that relationship and show them the love, they would have patients queuing up at the front door. Yeah, I, I, I was telling you know when I grew up, uh, mom made us go to Catholic mass every single day, from birth to you left home. So for 17 years, every single day, and I never once saw anybody raise their hand and ask the priest a question. Mm. They don't ask doctors, priests, everyone that ever bitches about the president. You know, I'll say, well, did you send him a letter? Yeah, no, yeah. I just bitch. <laughs> yeah. I just bitch. I, I've sent the president's so many well-intentioned letter. you know. I've always wondered if, you know, my, my phones are, are bugged because, I, you know, I, I, I wasn't going to sit there and bitch about Reagan and Bush 41 and Clinton and Obama and Bush 40. I, I was, I was going to tell him, you know, that yeah. this is obvious. Yeah. Uh, I sent my senators several letters, but they, but, but when you talk, when you ask a patient, you have any questions? They say no, and then you turn on your phone recorder, and you leave it there, and you leave, and then they turn to the hygienist or the assistant, and they got six, seven, eight questions. Absolutely. So, and, and yeah. those are the, and then those doctors aren't taking those two to the continued education course on root canals, fillings, and crowns, and then the reception is actually answering the most questions. Yes. And then they don't even, they don't even believe, like if you go to a dentist, say, well, what percent of your diagnosed treatment actually gets done? Yes. Yeah. So you say, oh, I don't know, 90, 95%. And you're just like, wow, you're, you're in a different planet. La -la -land. You're in La, -la Land. I mean, number one, nobody on earth has ever had a 95% success rate since, you know, Adam and Eve. Yeah. And, and, but now, you know, this dentist here in Parsons, Kansas, he's, he's the guy, yeah. you know, he's the guy and his average staff stays with him three years and he's got a 95%. Yeah. yeah. So they, so they don't know what they don't know. No, that's it, unfortunately. You know, that's why I think my local dentists, if they were clever, they would, you know, show me a bit of love, I think, because the patients are coming to me saying, I haven't been to the dentist for 10 years or five years or even three years or the, in the last 12 months, but I don't want to go back there because they said this, this and this and I wasn't happy with that. And, you know, I'm looking for a new dentist. Who should I go and see? You know, so then I've got kind of a group that I refer to and I know that this dentist does that well and this dentist does that well and, you know, so I can say, well, I think you might be a good match with such and such because of this reason and it works out really well. You know, it works and that connection, then they've come in, I've sent the dentist a letter to say, please, you know, accept Mrs. Such and Such as a new patient. This is what we've discussed. This is what she's looking for. And because we've already had that connection and the referral and there's a little network happening, the patient walks in on a different foot. You know, they're treated slightly differently. Um, they come in with they, trust. They, they come in with absolute trust. Paulette, no. I've got trust in Paulette. She sent me to you and now I'm trusting you because, you know, whereas if they went in kind of just off the street, that would be a completely different scenario. So, so your website is Pearly White Professional. Yes. And are you, do you also, um, do you sell a bleaching product? Well, I actually... Or, or, is it, or is this Jeff Knight's? Well, this is Jeff Knight's. I don't have my own bleaching product, but funnily enough, when I started out in my practice, I'd been using a system in, in private practice and lots of sensitivity and, you know, the results um, were a bit kind of, up and down and I thought if I'm actually going to run a teeth whitening and hygiene studio I need to be more consistent and be really confident in what the services that I'm offering so I you know Mr Google my favorite actually identified um, a product from the US 
So a dentist in the US had um, invent, well, invented, for want of a better word, um, done the research and development and this product had been around and was made in the US and it was in Europe. And it, one, was it, who was this it's one? called Beyond. Beyond this, Beyond Max, Beyond Polis, Beyond White. Can you send me that, Ryan? And oh, they... What is it? Beyond, B-E-Y-O-N-D. And it was Beyond Max, Beyond what? Yeah, there's be, the, the brand name is Beyond. And, and it's then bleaching. A, yeah. Be, so yeah. it's a bleaching product. Yeah. The crazy thing, they won Best Dental Whitening System with Dental Advisor, 15, 16, 17, and now 2018. And we don't have it in Australia. I completely, I mean, we have good products in Australia, like... You know, we've got um, SDI as our Australian kind of whitening go-to company. SDI? SDI, Southern Dental Oh, Industries. Southern Dental, Southern Dental yes, Industries. Yes, they do great. At, at a Melbourne. Yeah. And they, they start off as, they're the largest amalgam I manufacturer so. in the world. Yes. And they're rapidly um, diversifying to composites. Uh, yes, yes. They've And they're developing, they're doing a lot of research and development in yeah. in a few different areas. Um, so that's a good product as well. But I really liked my Beyond stuff from the US. So I just bring it in from the US now. And it is registered in Australia, so I can use it. And um, not enough... I don't know. I love it. I get really good results. And I also base my system on another US guy who has a, a protocol that he uses with his own brand of products. Um, and I kind of have implemented and which my one is own that? Uh, core whitening. With Rod Kerthy? With Rod Kerthy. So I think he has, I think he has 30,000 posts on Dental Town. Well, there you go. Yeah. So his system for whitening is great. And that's why I love using this. Um, so this is a Jeff Knight innovation, these medical grade silicon trays. And so now, if I'm doing an in-office whitening, I'll do, get them to do a pre-whiten with the trays. I'll do the in-office whitening, and then I'll stabilise it and lock it in with the post-whiten. So it's a really good um, system, and I'm getting more predictable results with that. So, so the website is um, Beyond Dent. So th is that the what people making the bleach in your kit? So, no, so this is an Australian, so this is Jeff Knight. So I'm a bit of a mix it up and do my own thing using different products from different companies. So the best of a couple of different companies and I've put my own protocol together. So this is an Australian product from Professional Dentist Supplies. So Jeff makes that, Jeff Knight. Yeah. And what is that, a carbamide this peroxide? This is carbamide peroxide. And what percent? So we've got a 10 and a 16. And we use that because the clinical studies, you know, the clinical studies all show that carbamide peroxide is the most effective whitening agent over a longer period of time. So it's annoying for the clients because they want quick fix whiten. But, you know, from a predictability perspective, no sensitivity and long term results, the carbamide is the best. So I use so a combination. So you do the pre-bleaching with the trays. Yeah, two days. Then you do, for two days. Yes. And then you do the in-office bleaching. Yes. For one hour. One hour. And then post beyond. off with Beyond. Yes. And then post. Oh, I do get them to do two or three days of the carbamide. To, and it's it kind of stabilizes it and locks it in. So they get really good nicely hydrated enamel and really good predictable whitening results um, with little or no sensitivity. And then they've got these trays so they can top up their whitening down the track with the gel. Well, and the nice thing about those pre-made trays is now you don't have alginates, pour up stone. I was pour, I was making my own trays. trays. That's so the crazy. time and expense involved. And how, so, much, and how much are those trays cost? So um, the dentist would buy these for about ninety dollars for the kit for the whole kit. So that's just what I what I learned about that is, I mean, good lord, to have the assistants go set up the alginates, take the alginates, then go back there and pour the models and let them set up for an hour and then and then trim the models, then yeah. do the suck down. I mean what that that's that's an hour. Plus and the the chair side time. So the dentist needs to run through if if you're doing take home whitening with the patients 
you know, that's dentist or hygienist chair side time plus the lab time plus the, you know, the components in the lab, um, the trays that they're paying for. So the average take home whitening in Australia is around $275 to $450 for the trays and the gel. So the dentist, you can sell this at the front counter. You know, you could have this sitting on the counter. The patients can ask about it, purchase it, take it home. You so know, for you under $150. So what, what, you, what is your recommend, suggested retail price? Around $150. Also, so you're Australian. Buying, so it costs $90 Australian yes. and you're selling it for $150 yes. at the counter. Yes. Nice. Yep. So there's no costs involved. And we have um, a legal requirement that you can't sell anything more than 6% hydrogen peroxide to a client. So if you buy whitening products in a pharmacy, in a supermarket or at the beauty salon, it has to be less than 6% and only a dental professional can prescribe more than 6% or provide a treatment with more than 6%. So because it, it's carbamide, it's under the 6% limit, you can have it at the counter in the DA's. Did you hear that um, went all the way to the United States Supreme Court? No. Yeah, so um, last year, um, I think it was uh, one of those, I think it was North Carolina or Tennessee, one, one of those, uh, um, there were people selling bleaching at the mall. Oh. And the, um, the dental board filed suit and said, you, you can't do that anymore. Yeah. And so they filed back and said, well, you know, we, we can't, we're not under your jurisdiction, you're, you're dental. And they said, well, that, that's our space and you can't do it, only, only dentists can. And it went to this, uh, all the way to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said that dental boards usually act um, as a good old boy club for their people they're regulating, and that um, that's a restraint of free and fair trade. Yeah. And um, and then there was another landmark decision in Texas where some guy declared himself a specialist in implantology, and the American Dental Association said, well, no, we only have nine specialties, and implantology is not one of them, so you can't say that. Wow. And they sued him, and it went all the way um, to the uh, Texas Supreme Court. And Texas Supreme Court said, "Who is the American Dental Association? You're not a government agency. You're not a regulatory you can't make agency. Those decisions, so yeah. you know you can kick him out of your club. But and in fact, this guy is a specialist in implantology. That's that's, that's all he does. Wow. He's not even um, so he's restricted his practice yeah, to you're implantology. So so, so is, the American Dental Association yes. is is starting to realize they're a club, and they're just a, a membership club." And the state boards are realizing that um, you just can't pass laws so that the dentists get more business. Two. Wow. You have to create more competition. Well, we had a case in Australia where a beauty therapist did teeth whitening and burnt all the gingiva of the client. And the client obviously complained about that. And that was the point where they went, right, that's it. This is the restriction. This is, you know, and lots of dental companies we're already selling much stronger whitening products. So a lot of companies went out of business at that point because they could no longer sell their products to um, the general population. So Ultradent makes opalescence. Yes. And um, Dan Fisher spent well north of a million dollars in legal fees trying to get it approved in the United Kingdom. Wow. In the United Kingdom, they just... Wouldn't. There was just one guy who said, no, dentists should not bleach teeth. And uh, <laughs> that just, was it. And, and again, that's a dentist yes. shooting their own profession in the foot. You know, yes. it wasn't. You say, well, who who kept dentists from bleaching in Nike? Kingdom? It's a damn dentist. Yeah. So. Well, we've got an actual. There's an actual. Um, what a couple of my clients are beauty pageant people, and they've won like Miss Australia, and um, one went over to the U.S. last year for the Miss Universe. Um, and did she meet Donald Trump? Not that I know of. Didn't he? Does he own? But they've got a little club where they've got a. Um, they bring in Crest strips from the US because Crest stops selling their teeth whitening strips in Australia and they're slightly stronger than the ones that are available currently in Australia from a different company. So there's a guy in regional Victoria that brings in a ship, shipment of it once every few months and all the beauty people buy direct from him to get their teeth whitening strips is quite well known in the industry. So, you know, there's 
always ways around things highly illegal but people are buying it and um he keeps bringing well, it in. If, if drugs can make it in australia i'm sure well, teeth whitening strips <laughs> teeth can make it whitening in strips i think Absolutely. it's so funny how uh, dennis always talk about laws are like well it's illegal for a hygienist to diagnose i'm like dude there's a thousand pounds of heroin and cocaine yeah. in Phoenix, Arizona, and you're worried about your hygienist about, reading an x-ray? Yeah. I mean, um, well, your husband's a police officer, so... Yes, so, so we way. know. What so we so if they banned all guns, who'd be the only people with guns? Well, the police officers and everyone else who wanted them. And it would be the criminals? Well, yeah. I mean, right? Well, that's it, because they would still ha they would just get them. Right, right. From wherever. Yeah. As many as they wanted. The interesting thing about those beauty pageants, I've seen this in 30 years, I've seen it um, about a half dozen times in 30 years, where um, girls are 18, 19, 20, 21, and they're trying to be a model, and they pull um, their lower molars to accent their zygomatic arch. They want their mandible to sink, sink in, in so their cheekbones get bigger wow and i know one girl who when she pulled her wisdom tooth pulled all three molars on the bottom of each side and then got cheek implants on her zygomatic arch because mm -hmm. she wanted this very accented mm -hmm. deal wow and i just want to say for the record Sweet. that when you look at my face it's all natural <laughs> no botox here i'm not even so, wearing a wig oh there you go this is all natural <laughs> But I mean, I, that that's commitment to modeling to yeah, pull all your molars. That's incredible. Haven't heard of that one. So the, they could order all of those? Oh, yeah. So these are available only through the dentist. We, we're not selling them, you know, through kind of but the they, pharmacy what, or anything what were they, like were they, that. But what website would they buy them? Their dentist. They'd have to buy it. So we don't sell. Because Professional Dentist Supplies is a wholesale manufacturer, we don't sell direct to the public. But do you sell direct to dentists? We sell to people like Henry Shine. So you Australia. only sell to the distributors? We sell to the distributors. Yeah. Amalgadent, you know, Adam Dental, Medident, the big... And what made you want to... Um, so in America, um, about 75% sell through distributors, like Henry Shine, um, um, and 25% sell direct. What made you want to go through distributors instead of selling direct? I think it's just got much bigger reach. You know, PDS has been established for 30 years, and so we've got a good distribution network with our with the big companies in Australia and the little companies for that matter. Um, so you know, it's easier to put. I can do training with staff at the companies and train five or ten people, and they're going to go out and each talk to another 20 or 30 people. Whereas if I was out on the road trying to sell direct to dentists. I'm not going to have the reach that I've got going by the main, these main distributors. So, you and know. what do they usually uh, market up? Like if they buy, if you sold them for a oh. dollar, what would they sell it for? Ten. Ten dollars? They market up tenfold. Sometimes, if there's an, if there's enough margin in it, you know, some of the things might go one or two dollars, and other things will go. So they their markup is often around seventy to eighty percent. Wow, that is amazing, and 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 it's a, it's a mixed business because I see like um you used to work for Densply yes and Densply has some divisions like Tulsa Dental Product which is their endodontic division they sell direct and then they'll have other divisions like Cock who only sells through distributors yeah and uh, and then I think the bizarrest strategy is Henry Schein won't let any of their companies list their products on Amazon if you list it on Amazon they won't carry you. Uh, okay. But Henry Shine Lisa sells Lauren. all of their Henry Shine products sundries on Amazon. on Amazon. It's like what? Yeah. So you can buy all the Henry Shine generics on Amazon, but if 3M or Densefly or Ivoclair they, they listen their it. stuff on that, Shine it through a hissy fit. Incredible. So we're we're in we're well, we're living in strange times. We are. Yeah. I mean, because the first thing I thought is I'd, I'd have that on Amazon in an hour. Oh, look, it, you know, and maybe down the track we'll develop um, a consumer version that we do sell direct to the public. Um, we might just kind of zhuzh it around a little bit, do something a bit different. So, but, I mean, because we've set it up, for example, we've got these QR codes now on our products so that someone can scan that code and it takes them directly to 
a YouTube video about the product. So, you know, people are going to be seeing these things on social media, on Facebook, on Instagram. There's a company in Australia that do the, you know, I just used my pearly whites product and look at my teeth and they do the groovy kind of blue light thing and everyone loves it. So maybe we'll add a blue light to it and sell it to the public and do the same kind of social media marketing. Now you should, uh, since the light has zero research, yeah. <laughs> all the research on the light says the light has no effect. No, but people love it. Yeah, so you should, you should have the first bleaching that works with your smartphone flashlight. No, there already is that. one. Uh, There's one already. They use the... Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You actually, you plug a connector into the end, into the microphone jack, and it's a little mouthpiece like that, and it shines on your teeth after nice. you put the gel on. Perfect. Nice. Since it doesn't do anything anyway, might so, as well just yeah, be flashy. People love it. And you're using your smartphone. Yeah. It's amazing. So, um, what else are you and Jeff Knight doing? Is it mostly the bleaching, the now? Oh, so we've got um, a, chlor a chlorhexidine product that's a, we call it chlorofluid gel, and it's a chlorhexidine fluoride gel. Um, it's been around in Australia for about 30 years, and it's a go-to product for patients who have gingivitis and who have had periodontal treatment or mouth ulcers. Um, and you know, we've all got those patients when you look in their mouth and they've got generalized bleeding and they say, but I brush and floss, you know, I do that every day. And, you know, they're the ones that you go, well, if you just use this gel, it's going to make all the difference. And you can still brush and floss every day, but brush and floss with the gel. And the, chlor the chlorofluid gel helps to eliminate the nasty bacteria that's causing the gingival bleeding and irritation. And, um, you know, they get great results with that. So... That's, well, one you know, of the things that um, it always had me exciting, like when you talk about carbon monoxide peroxide between ten percent and sixteen percent, uh, what I what I noticed the first five years out of school is that um, if you didn't floss every day and you had a kind of a mild gingivitis, that bleach would burn like hell, and you'd say this was very sensitive. Yes. But the people who had no bleeding points and you brush and floss every morning, brush and floss every night, they were fine. So I'd always tell them, I'd always plant the seeds in my face, and I said, look now. Um, this bleaching, you know, on me and my staff, there's no sensitivity. But everyone who's not a hardcore flosser, um, the gingivitis, that bleach is going to get in there yes. and it's going to sting and yes. it's going to be sensitive. But I noticed it was therapeutic. I mean, when you would bleach someone's teeth, you would also see really see improvement on their yeah. gingivitis and, and yeah. bleeding skills. Yeah. And um, so the same thing on these, um, the, so what I like with the, that bleaching tray, do you use the same tray on the chlorhexidine fluoride we, gel? We haven't recommended that you do. The ones we use for the chlorofluid gel are custom trays, just so that it... Um, is not leaching out into the mouth, and you're not swallowing. But is it the same tray as the bleaching? We don't have a cut. We don't have a tray in our. So the chlorofluid gel, we sell it in a pack called. We sell it individually, but because chlorhexidine is known to cause surface stain on the enamel, we sell it in a kit with a carbamide peroxide gel, and um, the dentist. You can either just brush it on, so you brush and spit, or the dentist can make a custom tray. Um, to put the gels into so that's different to this tray but it's a good idea because chlorhexidine does not stain teeth it stains plaque and what I loved about Paradox yeah. is they would come in and say this is staining my teeth and I'd say really mm. and so I'd set them up in the chair and I'd raise the chair and I'd give them the mirror and I'd just take a toothpick and then there'd be all this brown especially in between the teeth yeah. and I'd take a toothpick and I'd just wipe it off I said, now look, this stains plaque. Yes. That's why you have gum disease. You're not removing your plaque. Yeah. And that yeah. was another thing that I learned um, um, out of the gate that um, um, a, you know, would you rather cut a two by four in half with a handsaw or a power saw? Because some of those people, the only way they can make chlorhex and glucan and not stain their teeth is with an electric toothbrush. And especially if they were... Um, 60, 70, 80 years old, rheumatoid arthritis, the manual dexterity um, not quite is right difficult. in the yeah. head, yeah. Uh, slow, old, elderly, and you know, they have puffy fingers and they're going like that, 
they can't remove plaque. No. And then you, you watch some um, kid in college, like I watch my boys brush their teeth. I mean, I'm, I'm surprised sometimes the teeth don't fly out of their head. I mean, they're like, <laughs> you know, gray, gray. Oh my God. I mean, you, you think someone's going to die when he's brushing his teeth. <laughs> But that can't happen when you're 65, no. 75, 85, rheumatism, arthritis. Uh, and um, so the, so I really liked, um, I really enjoyed the Paradex stain as a teaching moment. Yes. It says, you know, you have gum disease and it's because you're not removing this plaque. Yes. So what, what do, are you a fan of electric toothbrush or are you just like manual or what do you, what do you like? Um, my favorite toothbrush in the whole world is the Curaprox brush the what curaprox can you so say that curaprox five it's it's called the curaprox five four six zero and it has five thousand four hundred and sixty bristles so super tightly packed small head really soft who makes it uh curiden switzerland i think make them switzerland yeah the rolex rolex of toothbrushes love them and they come in really funky colors you know, so I just buy those in bulk and give them to all my patients. I like the you electric right? toothbrush, but um. So is I, the Cure Prox is, is a manual brush. It's a manual brush. Okay. Yeah, and it's really tightly packed with super soft bristles, bucket mm -hmm. loads of them, more than any of the other bris you know brushes on the market. And yeah, so I'm a convert to the Cure Prox brushes. Love them. They're my favorite. Curaprox Ultra Soft Toothbrush. Yeah. At curaden.com.au. What's curaden.com.au? So I guess that they also make. Is um, that is that other a distributor? Products. Is curaden.com.au is that a distributor, or is the curaden Swiss just? Um, curaden's.com.au. I'm imagining is a distributor in Australia. They're in South Australia. And they distribute um, to all the major companies. Who then on sale to? So so then what were you saying about electric then? Yeah, so I, I, the electrics are okay. I don't love them. You're not a big I've fan got, of I've got yeah, I've got one, but I prefer the manual brush. And why is that? Oh, good question. You know, I've been using a manual brush for quite a few years, and I think I just like the control and the the tactile sensitivity. So you know, it's the same as when you instrumenting in a patient's mouth you've got you know hygienists have got really good tactile sense i can floss down the side of a tooth and feel a tiny little spicule of calculus so when i'm brushing you know you can get the bristles right into around the you know the areas that you need to get to with control as opposed to the toothbrush that often because of the vibration you're not getting that same sensation so i uh, yeah, I like the sensation of the manual brushing. So are you a fan of um, um, tongue brushing? Always. Tooth, tongue scrapers. Scraper. Always. Love them. I couldn't get... My mouth doesn't feel clean unless I've used a tongue scraper. And what a... Um, I'm Irish. And if I don't swish with uh, um, Jameson whiskey straight out of the bottle so, yeah. <laughs> for 60 seconds, swish and swallow. So, yeah. But um, So what tongue scraper do you like? Well, um... So there's a company called, well, I think it was called Therabreath, T H E R A T H E R A Therabreath. They went out of business, or so they had a um, a mouth rinse called Chlorosil or Chlorosil or Chlorosis. Some Chlorosis. 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 Out of Phoenix. And what was it out of Phoenix? I think because it came in a kit with that Chlorosis mouth rinse and. I don't think it's available in Australia anymore. And they came with these Something really flexible website. tongue scrapers. And I, because I had bought lots of them at the time, I've still got a bunch of them. But I haven't got enough that I can give them to my patients, and I would love them. So if you've got a contact, so would love to So closest was, know. back in the day, was Perry Radcliffe and Omar Reid. Oh, and okay. then um, Perry passed away, and his son... Uh, his son runs that company. Okay. But yeah, we can. Uh, oh. They're tongue scrapers. They're a really nice, flexible plastic, mm -hmm. and super why do, easy. Why do you think tongue scraping never took off to the degree that brushing, flossing took off? I just don't think people are aware of it. What dentist tells you to scrape your tongue? Only the people that try to manage bad breath. Well, that's not very many, then, is it? Right. So. 
Uh, you what know, about what about same question mouthwash? Are you a fan of mouthwash? Not really. And why is that? Uh, if it's a therapeutic mouthwash, I'm a fan of it. But I'm just a mouthwash for the sake of, you know, roll over and swish on Listerine when you wake up in the morning. Just go and brush your teeth. Mm. You know, clean and, your teeth and properly. To be quite honest, if you really were a big fan of the research, the research says the toothpaste doesn't even matter. It's, it's, it's dry just, brushing. It's actual physical action. Yeah. Of Did the you brush. believe in dry brushing? Uh, I don't. Re I don't. I believe in it, but I don't recommend. I so, say so. I dry, dry brushing. Dry brushing removes all the plaque, but the patient wants whiter, brighter, sexier teeth. They and want to get rid of morning breath, breath. minty yeah. breath. Yeah. yeah. I mean, My mum's from an island in the Indian Ocean, and her Sri toothbrush Lanka? from Reunion Island. Your mom's from Reunion from Island. Reunion, yeah. And that's French. Yes. So you speak French? Yes. Wow. So her toothbrush when she was growing up was a stick with, they used to chew on the end of it. Mm -hmm. There's a name for them. They're called mm -hmm. like sag or yeah. sag or something. Big in Africa. Yeah, same. Because yeah. Reunion was a lot of Africans in Reunion because yeah. it's off the coast of Africa. Um, and her, she's 80 and got all her teeth. Yeah. Perfect. But they also, um, I was in a... In fact, I have a YouTube video on it. When I was in Tanzania, I followed this guy. I said, how do you brush your teeth? And I followed him. And he's in his tribal day. I follow him into a tree. Oh, yes. He goes up in a tree. He whacks out this stick. And he's uh, brushing it. And, and it's it's a very effective means. But the other thing about those guys is um, they had a very paleo diet. I mean, they, oh, yes. they ate meat, vegetables, roots. I mean, basically, they, they forced and yes. then you go into the big African cities, Civil, yeah, and it's coke, flour, Pepsi, sugar, flour, processed yeah. foods. But yeah, uh, completely different. There's a big difference. Yeah, and it also yes. also really depend on um, where you are in Africa because there's a lot of areas where the uh, the lake water and the river water is four or five or six part per million. So everybody has intense fluorosa fluorosis around Tanzania. So you got a lot of spotted teeth. Yeah. They don't have any cavities. And yeah. I'll never forget because we went to uh, work in an uh, orphanage one time in Tanzania. And there was like 300 kids. And I mean, the, the home care was almost nothing. And they there was almost no work to be done because they all had fluorosis. They all had okay. they all had pretty, I, I would say moderate fluorosis. So they had no decay. Incredible. Yeah. Well, well, that's the thing with the dry brushing is, you know, I always say to my clients, toothpaste doesn't clean your teeth. You know, it's the brushing action that makes all the difference. So use it because it makes your mouth feel fresh, but you only need a tiny bit to make, you know, to get the freshness. And the rest of it's a really good brushing action that makes all the difference in some floss. Floss on a stick is good. Anything to get in between your teeth and, you know, zhuzh around so you get rid of the bacteria, that's all better than, than nothing at all. So. Well, man, uh, I'm so honored to have you come on the show. I mean, to think that you were the one who wrote legislation 30 years ago to get hygienists in Victoria. And here you are 30 years later trying to get independent practicing yes. hygienists. I mean, you've been a pioneer and a mover and a shaker for 30 years. It's an honor to know you. Thank, Thank you, you so much Howard. for coming Thank on the you. show. Can I just say, your pr I saw you in Melbourne last week and it was honestly the most entertaining and clinically or well, business relevant dental presentation I've seen in 30 years. It was the way you present and the interaction with the audience and the stories that get the message across in such um, an entertaining way but you know serious messages was really powerful. I think I've stopped talking about it all week. I really enjoyed it. So I'm Aww. so looking forward to your presentation tomorrow. All right. Fantastic. Thank you. Well, you know, it's, it's, uh, I wanted to say one thing about a presentation. I've seen a lot of dental presentations. Yes. And, um, the, um, the PowerPoint slide is a crutch. Um, if I told you to give me a one hour, how many children do you have? Three. If I told you to give me a one-hour presentation on your children, how many PowerPoint slides would you need? Three. Would you stand behind a podium? No. Would you go? Would you have handouts? 
You know, I mean, you if you're speaking about a subject you love, and that's yes. why I like I think the greatest art form is stand-up comedy because um there's no props. There's just you and a microphone. Yes. It's eye-to-eye -eye contact and it's in your face. It's describing things so you can see it without yes. seeing a PowerPoint. I mean, or reading stuff on yeah, a screen and all this tech. And, so and, and, and you blah. go to some of these presentations and they have three big screens yeah. and three projectors. You're just like, okay, at that point, Enough. you just need to go home. <laughs> you know? True. And um, so yeah. it's it's uh, if you're talking about a subject you love, a subject you're passionate about, and you get rid of all the props. And I learned this early in my career. Because about um, back in the day when I started lecturing, airlines were a mess, and a lot of times they lost your luggage. And you had these big carousels of slides. Yes. And so I'd be traveling in a, you know, sweats and a t-shirt and have all that checked on in my luggage. Then they lose the luggage. And the first time it ever happened to me, I show up at this seminar, and I'm in sweats and tennis shoes. And I don't have any of my PowerPoint presentations, and I'm like, oh, my God, this is just going to be horrible. But the show must go on. And I went out there, and at the end of the day, I go, that was the best seminar I ever gave. Yeah. But then I went right back to all the PowerPoint That's bullshit insane. and all that <laughs> stuff. And then about a year or two later, they lost all my luggage again. And I went in there with sweats and tennis shoes and crushed it. And after that happened three times, I just said, uh, and it's it. sad because these people who have these, um, put on these seminars, they'll say, well, how was the PowerPoint presentation? How yes. was the handouts? Yeah. How was, and, and everything they're asking you to critique on yeah. Is like, well, was he on the right drug? Was he drunk enough? Yeah. Uh, you know, was he, you know. It's That's like every it. everything they're asking you about, you shouldn't even have. No. It, it's kind of like when they're teaching you how to read food labels. If there's a label on the food, you shouldn't be eating it. No. There, there's no label on <laughs> bananas and apples no. and steak and fish and chicken. Yeah. It's only on processed shit. Absolutely. So the, the, the story of reading labels, if it has a label, don't eat it. Yeah. And, uh, and as far as the presentation, and, and that's what I tell people if they want to get into presentation. Um, in a big city like Sydney or Melbourne, they, they have comedy club lessons. These comedy deals have lessons where you'll do it like three nights a week for a month. And they have improv, because a lot of people are afraid of the questions, because they don't know what the question is going to be. Yeah. So go take an improv class. But if you go, take a, if you go learn the science of stand-up comedy and the science of improv, like I did as a student. I mean, yes. I, I, I went and learned it. You really, and, and I think it helps with um, presenting treatment because when you walk into the room with a new patient, just like when you walk out on stage on stand up or on improv, you've got about 30 seconds to establish likability and trust. Yes. You, they're, they're, no human's going to give you three, they're not going to say there three or four minutes later, who so is this it, Paula? Yeah. They just instantly decide do I like you, trust you, do I want to engage you? Yeah. Or am I at the wrong place? Um, in, yeah. Yeah. I'm switched off. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you can take it back to your dating days. You know, how many times were you on a date and like five yeah. seconds into this date, you're like, yeah. this is a really bad this, idea. I need to get home. Yeah, Someone especially for called. me because yeah. my first five dates were all five of my sisters. <laughs> and I just said the whole time, what's going to happen when dad finds out? And, uh, but, uh, but thanks so much for having me. Thanks. I can't wait to see you until tomorrow.